Hi, I'm your host, Dee Dee Chang. Audio Builders TV presents Acoustics with Jay Fergoletto. This multi-part series is an overview of acoustic topics. For a more in-depth look, we highly recommend Jay Fergoletto's book and courses. Jay is an award-winning veteran mastering engineer who has owned high-end mastering studios in Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Boston. His clients have included Alice in Chains, Annie DeFranco, Oasis, India Ari, Black Eyed Peas, Blondie, In Excess, and many more. Albums that Jay has mastered have earned a Grammy Award, as well as gold and multi-platinum record awards. He is an accomplished pianist and multi-instrumentalist. Audio Builders TV is produced by the students of Concord Carlisle High School with help from Colonial Sound and CCTV. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and subscribe to our mailing list at audiobuildersworkshop.com. <laughs> Audio Builders. Audio Builders Workshop is a work group for the Boston chapter of the Audio Engineering Society. Hi, it's Jay Frigoletto for Audio Builders Workshop, continuing our series of talks on acoustics. Uh, we are into large room acoustics right now, things like concert halls, things like large performing spaces, recital halls, theaters. Um, so let's talk about reverb time. Again, sound is bouncing off walls, coming back. How long does it last? This is our reverb time. Um, when we talk about T60 or RT60, we're talking about the time it takes for that uh, initial, the energy from the initial impulse to diminish to one millionth of its initial intensity, which is a reduction of 60 decibels of sound pressure level. Um, the classic Sabine equation, Sabine, Wallace, Clement, Sabine, Sabine, I never know. Anybody know how to say that one? <laughs> Let us know. Uh, I'm going to go with Sabine. So the classic Sabine equation uh, is written as um, RT60 or T60 equals 0.049V over A. So what is that V? That's the volume of the room. Uh, what is A? That's the total absorption of the room. If you're dealing with metric system, um, instead of obviously your volume in feet cubed, you're going to have meters cubed. Uh, and uh, you're going to use the form of 0.016V over A. So back to, since we're in America, we're going to use these uh, old archaic systems. We're the only people, it seems, you know, not using metric right now. But hey, such is the case. So 0.049V over A. Um, well, how do we figure this out? Well, figuring out a room volume, well, that's easy enough. That's just your length times your width times your height. Great. Uh, that was easy. How do we figure out the total absorption? Well, now we have to figure out what are these walls made of? Is there anything on them? Um, is there stuff in the room? Is there carpeting? Uh, what's on the ceiling? Things like that. Um, so you can find uh, lists online. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you every single sort of material here. Uh, but again, we talked about these reflection coefficient versus transmission coefficient versus absorption coefficient. So there's going to be an absorption coefficient for each material. There's easily findable online these things that say, hey, here's how much uh, you know, a brick wall reflects. Hey, here's how much um, you know, one inch thick uh, compressed fiberglass. Uh, here's how much you know, some carpeting does. Um, here's how much a piece of gypsum board, sheetrock, drywall. Uh, and again, you think, well, isn't that reflective? Well, not at low frequencies. It's not. It's a flexural absorber. It absorbs low frequencies, reflects high and mid. And of course, here's where we come to octave bands. Uh, the amount of absorption or reflection that happens uh, from a material, very different at different octave bands. So make sure you look at this, what's happening at the 125 band versus 500, 1K, 2K, 4K. Um, because if you just put a bunch of stuff in there that's going to absorb all the highs and mids, you're going to let that low frequency ring on forever. That's no way to have a, an even good sounding space. Um, so when you figure out this total uh, absorption, um, you're, you're basically figuring out the absorption coefficient um, and measuring it in Sabin's. Again, if you want to really know more of the uh, math, and again, that is Sabin's without the E, uh, the unit named after him which is a unit of uh, how much absorption there is. So you're going to actually figure out, um, and again, you can find this math online if you really want to start figuring out reverb times. 
Uh, but the idea is you add up, okay, how many Sabins does this uh, material on this wall over this much area contribute, and then what's my total absorption in that room at this particular octave fan? Uh, you plug it into that famous uh, equation that we had up on the screen a little bit ago, and you figure out, okay, here's what the reverb time's gonna be. Um, so the other things in, uh, in large rooms that you, you might wanna know about, um, in addition to the, the reverb time, there's a thing called uh, critical distance, uh, and that's, that's worth, worth noting. Um, and again, there's, um, there's some math. Again, if you really want to find the, the math out, you can look online. But quickly, to figure out the critical distance, what is the critical distance? This is where the direct field and the reverberant field meet. So I'm speaking. I'm in a big room. You're very close to me. You're going to hear more of my direct sound, the direct voice more than the reverberated sound that's around me. Uh, we're in a big church. I'm, you know, up giving whatever. I'm giving my sermon. <laughs> uh, you're way in the back. Well, now you're going to hear all of that reverb much greater than my direct sound. As a matter of fact, it might be very difficult to understand me in the back of the room like that. Uh, there's going to be so much of this reverberant field, and you're not going to hear as much of the direct sound. The critical distance is that spot at which the two meet, and you're hearing just as much reverberant sound as you are direct sound. Um, this is definitely good to know in a large room, especially if it's a room designed for speech, uh, because, again, as you get into the reverberant field, it's going to be much more difficult to understand what that speaker is saying. Um, to figure this out, um, again, there's an equation for that. You also need to know what the room constant is, which has to do with um, the sort of statistical behavior of the absorption in a room over a certain area. But anyway, so you'll get to that stuff. If you want to know more of that, that's fine. Uh, look it up. Easy to find. Um, but uh, these are some of the things that you want to know if you're designing in a large room for speech versus music. In music, you actually want some of that reverberation, especially if you're dealing with classical music. Uh, stuff from the Romantic period tends to like longer reverb times. Some of the Baroque stuff likes slightly shorter reverb times because originally it was performed in um, these uh, churches which were getting smaller around that time of the Baroque period. Um, again, Bach uh, is sort of the most famous uh, composer from that era, and uh, he was in these Lutheran churches, and most of his, his music was worship music. And so it sort of lends itself to the... Um, you know, the, the reverb times that were in those spaces at the time. Uh, as you get into the Romantic period, these spaces are getting larger, uh, you're getting more reverberation, and, and the music tends to be influenced by that. Um, so, and obviously if you're dealing with speech, you don't want these big long reverb times, and you want to get as much direct sound as you can to uh, the listeners uh, and not have it be swamped by the, the reverberation. Um, so these are uh, times where you'll be saying, okay, well, what's my critical distance? What's my reverberation time? And let me try to get it to be kind of at my target range. Hey, this is going to be a classical musical hall. We want, uh, you know, 1.9, 2.0, maybe 2.1 even, uh, if it's primarily for romantic music. Um, if you want to do uh, something that's going to be a multi-purpose hall, it's going to deal with different kinds of music and maybe some theater, eh, you're going to want to get that reverb time you know, down more like one and a half. If, uh, if this is for speech, uh, where you're doing a lecture um, or whatever else, uh, anything that's really primarily designed for speech, you, know, you either want to get that reverb time maybe even a little bit below that, or at least to 1.5. Um, preferably less. A lot less is even better for intelligibility. Um, or you make that space smaller, get the people closer, get closer to that direct field. So this is going to let you know how much absorption. I do these calculations in reverb time. Oh, wow, hey, wow, that's going to be way too long of reverb time because this needs to be a multi-purpose hall or a place where we're going to do dramatic things. We're going to do drama, not music. Um, so uh, again, that lets you know, hey, I need to add more absorption. And then you say, great, I'm going to put up this thin, fuzzy stuff on the wall, which, of course, the low frequencies just go right through and bounce back. 
So do your calculations at all these different octave bands, and then you figure out, wow, in the low frequencies, the reverb time is twice as long as up here. You know what? That's not good. When we said that we want it to be one and a half, we didn't mean one and a half up here and three down there. Too long. Okay, we have to figure out how to get more low frequency absorption happening in there. Um, that will, of course, come in a later workshop when we talk about bass trapping and techniques for low frequency absorption. Uh, and for that, let's um, skip ahead to our next one. Check back with us when we talk about the first large space that was designed scientifically. Uh, and that, of course, is Boston Symphony Hall. Trey Fergletto for Audio Builders Workshop. Tune back in for the next one. <laughs>